Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna. I am Anna Jaworski and the host of this program. This is the first episode of Season 12. Our theme this season is organ donation and transplantation. I'm very excited for today's show to feature our Heart Dad in Israel and also a dear friend who has been working very closely with me as the host of Heart to Heart with Michael. I've known Michael Lieben for almost 20 years. And now we're working together for the Hug Podcast Network to provide podcasts to both the congenital heart defect and bereaved communities. Michael Lieben is the father of Liel. Liel was born with double outlet right ventricle and a ventricular septal defect. In her life, she had three heart surgeries. At age four, Liel was diagnosed with autism and then at 13 with epilepsy. Liel was a stunningly happy child who loved music and creative activities. She was happy every single day of her life, and the only thing she totally hated was epilepsy and the lack of control that engendered. At age 13 and a half, she had gone to live in a home with other autistic children, many of whom had epilepsy, so they weren't surprised when she developed it. Nobody, however, expected that one morning it would simply take her without warning. When Liel passed, her parents were able to donate organs, and in so doing, saved the lives of four women between the ages of 7 and 67. Michael and his wife, Leora, also have two other children, Idan and Sapir, who were wonderful siblings to Liel. Michael is the host of Heart Art with Michael, a program for the bereaved community. He is now in his second season. Michael is the technical director for the Hug Podcast Network, and he works closely with me on Heart to Heart with Anna. So welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna, Michael. Well, thank you very much. It's really very nice to be back here. Well, it's great to have you back. My longtime listeners may remember you from Season 7, when our theme was congenital heart defects around the globe, and we visited with you from Israel. That was exciting because it was not only a chance to talk about Liel, which is always a wonderful thing, but it was an introduction to me into the whole Hug podcast network, and it's been very, very happy since then. It has been. Well, let's get started and talk about Liel's organs and your family's decision to donate them. Liel went into epileptic seizure on a Friday morning, early in the morning, and it was probably sudden unexpected death in epilepsy, SUDEP, which is something they don't talk about much. They were able to stop that and she got to the hospital in the late morning with a low blood pressure and a heartbeat. And by the time we got up there, it was a two-hour drive. By the time we got up there, at about a quarter to 12, the doctor told us we had two options. We had bad and really bad. And really bad was that she might wake up. So we knew where we were heading and it took about three or four days to finally land at a determination of brain death. And we knew from the beginning that's where it was going. So the hospital found a way to put us up for a few days. And that Saturday afternoon, when we were walking around the grounds, I was talking with Leora, my wife, and she said, you know, you should really ask the doctor about transplants. And it hadn't occurred to me that this was even an option. And it's funny because that's something that we always thought was a good idea. So it is something that you all had talked about previously. No, we never discussed it previously because it never came up in the family as something that, you know, as something realistic. But but our general opinions were, most of us, our general opinions were that it's probably a good idea to do it. To me, it seemed normal because having grown up in the States, I'd seen it a lot. And I remember the first heart transplant in South Africa from Dr. Christian Barnard when I was just a little kid. So this was always something in my mind that was possible. And so we hadn't thought much about it. But when it came up, Liara is the one who brought it up. And of course, I agreed right away. But I did want to discuss it with the whole family. I said, this is something that we really have to do together. Yes, absolutely. Because it's not quite as common in Israel as it is in the United States, is it? No, not not really, not at all. And there are some reasons for that. It's not well known. And there are religious implications of donation. And we can get into that if you'd like. But it's been a controversial thing for a very long time within the Jewish community. Not so much anymore. But it was for a while. And if you'd like, I can go into some of that. Well, yeah, let's go ahead and talk about what the religious implications of organ donation are. Well, number one, there's always the question of, well, what's going to happen in the in the resurrection? People will come back missing organs. How's that going to work? And my answer to that has always been with a slight giggle. Unless the resurrection is about 48 hours away, most people aren't going to have those organs anyway. And that's true. And it's humorous, but it's true. And the other... Th- I agree with you. I think it's funny that you said you say that with a giggle. Well, I do, because if you think about it, I mean, you know, most things in Judaism tend to be logical and tend to make sense. At least a lot of things do. And so that's something that never made sense to me. The other thing is that if God is going to resurrect me and everybody around me, if he can do that, he can also resupply the missing organ. So I was never concerned about that. 
It's interesting, just as an aside, that one of the greatest American rabbis, uh, Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, in the 60s, came a long way in his evolution on the subject. He had originally said it was a terrible thing to do. He didn't understand, or nobody actually understood it. They didn't have in the 60s a good definition of death. And so clinical death, he thought, wasn't enough. And he called it, in fact, a double murder, which I'm very happy to say that by the time he died, some 10, 15 years after that decision, he revisited that decision and decided that knowing what we know about brain death and its irreversibility, that organ donation is a very good thing to do. He came down strongly in favor of it. And that opened the way for the rabbinate in Israel to also make a a final finding that it's a good thing to do. And in Judaism, that's very important because... Most of the 316 commandments that we talk about, most of them fall by the wayside when you're faced with the question of saving a life. But saving a life comes higher than almost every other commandment that there is. And so being able to do that and and knowing that you're doing a good thing, and that you're saving a life, really opened the way for the religious decisions to do that. Unfortunately, I would say that's not been accepted by everybody. And so it remains a question. But officially, it is not a question. Officially, it's a very, very good thing to do. And it's the sort of thing that we'd like to see more of. I agree. What do you think is the biggest obstacle preventing this from being more widely accepted in Israel? Ignorance, straight out. About a week before we were facing a decision about Liel's organs, there was the famous case of a soccer player who was tragically killed in an accident. I think he was on a motorcycle. And his will was to donate organs. And his family was about to go along with that. And a rabbi showed up and said, you can't do that. Maybe he'll come back. And of course, that's just medically ridiculous and made no sense at the time. But they wasted enough time revisiting their decision that they lost the availability to use his organs. That's so tragic. It is tragic because it didn't have to happen. And about a week later, we come along and it's now it's the end of December and we all died on December 31st. And by January 1st, we were out there saving a, a bunch of people. We saved four lives, four women in Israel. And we thought that was a good thing to do. That's a wonderful thing to do. And we'll be talking about that more in our next segment. Home Tonight Forever by the Baby Blue Sound Collective. I think what I love so much about this CD is that some of the songs were inspired by the patients. Many listeners will understand many of the different songs and what they've been inspired by. Our new album will be available on iTunes, Amazon.com, Spotify. I love the fact that the proceeds from this CD are actually going to help those with congenital heart defects. Enjoy the music. Home Tonight Forever. Anna Jaworski has written several books to empower the congenital heart defect, or CHD, community. These books can be found at Amazon.com or at her website, www.babyheartspress.com. Her bestseller is The Heart of a Mother, an anthology of stories written by women for women in the CHD community. Anna's other books, My Brother Needs an Operation, The Heart of a Father, and Hypoplastic Left Heart Syndrome, a handbook for parents, will help you understand that you are not alone. Visit babyheartspress.com to find out more. You are listening to Heart to Heart with Anna. If you have a question or comment that you would like addressed on our show, please send an email to Anna Jaworski at Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. That's Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. Now, back to Heart to Heart with Anna. Michael, before the break, we were talking about how you were able to save four women with Liel's organs. Why don't we start by talking about when you met the 67-year-old woman who received Liel's lungs? Well, I didn't exactly meet her. I got a phone call one day from a number I didn't recognize, and it was an older woman on the phone. And through the course of the conversation, the first minute or two, I understood that she was the woman who received two lungs. At the same time, I also understood that every breath she took and every word that she said originated in my daughter's lungs, which was a very powerful moment. I'm surprised I got through it, actually. I later found out she told me her name is Mazal, which means luck or fortune in Hebrew. And she does have a lot. When people say Mazal Tov, it means good luck, right? Congratulations. And she really did have good fortune. Last I heard, she's still doing very well. And it's a pleasure to speak with her. It was a very powerful moment. And she called me. She said, I have to tell you, uh, the reason I'm calling is because I just want you to know I feel very, very bad. 
that I benefited from your daughter's dying. And I said to her, she was gone anyway, and that it was fine with us that we could soften the blow and do something good. And we understood that while we were home sitting and crying, we understood that four families would be singing and dancing, and we were very okay with that. And then she said, well, that's what the rabbi told me, and that's what the social worker told me, and that's what my friends and family all told me. But I needed to hear that from you. I needed to be, in a sense, absolved. I needed for you to tell me that it was okay, and now I'm okay. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah, I still get a little choked up from that. That's a really powerful interchange of ideas right there that she was feeling some guilt and yet you were feeling happy to know that because of Liel's passing she was able to help somebody else because otherwise it seems to me all you would have is the passing to deal with you don't have the knowing that something good happened from that well that's the funny thing because the emotions are completely mixed up and sometimes upside down obviously we're very very sad we didn't want to lose her and at the same time i don't know if happy is the right word but we're pleased that we were able to take that moment of terrible pain and turn it at least for somebody else into a moment of joy so yeah we're happy to have helped and very upset to have been in the position where we could have helped it's not a place you want to be but when you're there you want to do the right thing and that in some sense ameliorates the pain it'll never go away Doing the right thing is always good. I think it's amazing that you actually got to speak to the woman who received your daughter's lungs, but I know that you did get to meet face-to-face the little girl who received Liel's kidney. So why don't you tell me about that? Well, that, that was actually was an amazing story because I got an email from my nephew in New Jersey saying that there's a guy named Hussein who wants to talk to you. He thinks his daughter may have your daughter's kidney. Now, what happened? Hussein works in a place in Jerusalem where a lot of Americans go to study. And he was telling people there about what happened to his daughter, how she was waiting for kidney, and they were told already she wasn't going to get it. And then at the last minute, a kidney became available. So he was very happy. He was telling people about it. And one of the young ladies studying there knows my nephew, and she heard the last name Lieben. So she wrote an email to New Jersey saying, are you related to this guy Lieben, whose daughter donated kidneys, Hussein is looking for him. So my nephew said, yeah, that's my uncle. And he emailed me. And Hussein lives maybe 10 minutes from here. (laughs) But it was your nephew over 10,000 miles away. Over 10,000 miles away. (laughs) Exactly. The power of email and modern electronics. But how did they know? They knew Liel's name? They knew Liel Lieben? No, they knew Lieben because my nephew was a Lieben. They knew when they received her kidney that it was from a No. I don't know how they made that connection exactly. He might have because we were written up in the newspaper and I had appeared on the radio with Hussein's wife who spoke enough Hebrew that we could be interviewed together. So it's very possible that they heard the name Lieben somewhere and then picked it up. That makes total sense. In any case, so I get this email from my nephew in New Jersey saying, you got to call Hussein. I call Hussein and he's like really excited. If you haven't figured out from his name, Hussein is not from the Jewish part of town. And so this is a politically charged moment where we donated our kidney to a seven and a half year old Palestinian girl. They don't ask you and that's fine with us. It's all delivered by merit. There's no questions about who's from where. It's all done by who needs it. And he says, we're coming to visit you or you're coming to visit us, but we have to meet. I said, well, okay. Nobody in my family wanted to meet with any of the recipients, which I respect. I'm completely different from that. And I wanted every chance to meet anybody I could. Sure. Now, I had already been interviewed on the radio with Hussein's wife. So I asked, I said, listen, do you mind? I'm a filmmaker. Can I bring a cameraman with me for this meeting? And they said, sure. So me and a cameraman went out to meet them in their home, and I met the little girl, and they spoke a little bit of Hebrew and a little bit of English, and I spoke even less Arabic, and <laughs> it's amazing. But my cameraman could speak all three, so it was all right. And oh, wow. uh, Yeah, so we got along for, well, it was a couple of hours, and we were talking, and it was wonderful. At one point, I hugged this little girl. She's seven and a half years old, and at the moment that I hugged her, my kidney was the same distance from that kidney that it had always been whenever I hugged my own child. So there was that. And, of course, they were all happy to see me. The first thing I did was break down and sob all over the house. Well, how touching would it be to meet somebody who quite possibly might not have survived without your daughter's kidney? She definitely would not have survived. They told the parents, it's time to pack up. We're not going to find it. So she definitely would not have survived. You know, people don't think about it. But if you need a kidney, it means it's not that you have one that works. It means you have zero. So there was nothing. She was on dialysis and she wasn't doing very well and it was over and they were getting ready for the worst and suddenly we came by with the answer. So I didn't know that you had been on the radio with the wife. The husband didn't go to that interview as well? 
Well, the husband, I don't think his Hebrew was as good as the mother, or whatever reason, I don't know how they made that decision. We got a call from Israel Army Radio, which is one of the most popular radio stations in the country, and they said, would you be willing to go on? Now, we were still sitting Shiva, it was that still that first week after she had died, so we were sitting and available, and I said, yeah, I'd be willing to do that. It was very difficult, because it was while I was on the phone with the radio, that's when I heard the mother talking, and that's when I found out that the doctors had told them it was over. Okay, so again, live, they heard me break down because that that was a moment. Yeah. So most of us think when we hear people on the radio that people go into a studio to record, but you were able to do this on a telephone just like you and I are recording this show. Right. And so you didn't really meet the mother. No, I hadn't met the mother. I heard her voice. We were, they were blocking us on and off so that, you know, one could go on the air and the other one was waiting, but I could hear her while I was on the phone. And apparently in the studio, they heard me going, oh my gosh. So they heard that and they said, this is a big thing for you, isn't it? I said, yeah, this is pretty big because I didn't know. Now, another thing I want to say, it's very important in the Arab culture, fatherhood is something that you don't question. Fatherhood is something that is sacred and you leave it alone. I don't know a lot of Arabic, but I know enough to understand that when he was talking to her, he pointed at me and he said, he's also your father. Oh, wow. That's huge, Michael. Yeah, it really is. I'm breaking up right now. It really is a big thing. Wow. Let's talk about Liel's legacy. What do you feel Liel's greatest gifts were? Well, she taught us a lot of things. She taught us to find joy in everything. She taught us to laugh with everything that happens. And in so doing, we were able to, I think, memorialize her in a way that we took a terrible, terrible tragedy. And in some respect, we couldn't turn it around 180 degrees. She's not here. But we were able to find meaning and value with what was left for us to do. I wouldn't say that there was value in her death because there isn't any. But I would say that when you're in a situation where there is nothing left to do, you got to do the right thing. And for us, that was the most important thing. And it didn't bring her back, but in some sense, she didn't completely leave us. And so we still have her joy and we have her laughter. And we can also be comforted knowing that four people were saved that night. And again, I've said this many, many times, but We're aware that while we were sitting huddled together as a family and crying, four other families were jumping for joy, dancing and singing, and it's totally all right with us. Texas Heart Institute were offering us a mechanical heart, and he said, no, Dad, I've had enough. Give it to someone who's worthy. My father promised me a golden dress to twirl in. He held my hand and asked me where I wanted to go. Whatever strife or conflict that we experienced in our long career together was always healed by humor. Heart to Heart with Michael. Please join us every Thursday at noon Eastern as we talk with people from around the world who have experienced those most difficult moments. I am with Origami Owl Jewelry, and we personalize lockets. It has helped me heal so much by having that locket. I've had other friends and customers who have created lockets. They love their lockets, and they gift lockets to people who are bereaved, or they're celebrating somebody. To get your own Origami Owl locket, contact Nancy Jensen on Facebook or her website, fancydancyme.origamiowl.com. Michael, now you and your family are very strong advocates for organ donation. Can you tell us about the special tradition that the organ donation organization participates in every year in Israel? Well, I'm not sure if tradition is the right word. It sounds a little bit religious. But what they do do is they keep us close uh, and they make us feel like a family. And so there's a bunch of things that they do to help keep us together and to remind us always that we have family. And it's a very, very big family. Some of the things they do every year on the high holidays and around September, October, and also on Passover, which is generally around late March, early April, a truck shows up and they give us food. Now, we didn't know this was coming the first year. What's interesting is that the first year this happened, we, we were just moving on with our lives and Passover was coming. And everybody's dream on Passover is not to have to clean the oven. So we actually ordered a new oven that year because we desperately <laughs> needed one. And I get a phone call from this guy says, I'm bringing you something. I, and I just figured that was the oven. It was two days before Passover. The oven's due. And I said, well, okay, I'll be home. You bring in the oven. He didn't answer me. You no, know, he said something. I don't know. I just have some boxes. I don't know what he's talking about. 
<laughs> guy shows up. I figure he's going to bring up an oven. He says, come down and pick it up. So what are you talking about? Come down. I got some boxes. Now, apparently there's a note that goes into the box that they neglected to put. So we had no idea where this is coming from. I said, who are you? He said, I'm from the Ministry of Health. And then he left. And he left with these boxes, like care packages of food. And I'm thinking, well, we don't need that. And I've helped deliver food to the needy before. And that's it looks like this. Eventually, I figured it out. made some phone calls. It's the Ministry of Health which is the parent organization for the transplant organization, they, as a gesture of friendliness every year around the holidays, throw out some food at you, which is actually very, very nice. I don't mean to say it quite like that, but they deliver food, and it's, it's actually a big help. About two years ago, they started doing it also on the high holidays, so we never know it's coming. It's always a very nice surprise. But what they do also, which is much more serious, is that every month they have lectures in Tel Aviv if you want to go. They have support groups. They have discussions. And then I found out also this year, something they do every two years, and only for those groups of those two years. So we've got ours. We're not going to get another one. We were invited to the president's residence in Jerusalem. And there there was a big ceremony. And there we met with the larger family of donors, which is always very nice. They also brought a recipient to speak, which was very, very touching. And so it was a chance for us to sort of get together and be recognized by the state of Israel as having done something good, which always makes you feel good. You know, it's always very nice to be recognized. People have thrown a word around. They've thrown the, the word hero around. I don't feel that I'm a particular hero. But it is very nice to be recognized. It's not something we can do a second time, I think, but it's something that we did. And sometimes you have to be reminded. You have to be made f to feel good again about it because it's a very difficult subject and it's very wrenching from time to time. Well, it's interesting to me how in segment two you said that father told the little girl that now she had another father, which is a symbol of family. And when you started talking about this tradition, that it's about family. It's really saying, look, you're part of a larger community and they're not letting you forget what it is that you did, that they're recognizing how important that contribution was. Well, we're in a very large family of bereaved. I mean, everybody in some sense, if they look for it, they're bereaved in one way or another. But within that community, there's a subgroup, which is much, much smaller. And that's the people who donate. And the truth is that I can't speak for other members of my family, but I do feel very, very close. And when I'm with the other members of that family of donors, we share something that's very hard for anybody else to understand. It's almost like twin siblings. There's something between us. There's a communication. There's a language. There's a look in your eye that says a lot that no one else can understand. And we need to get together once in a while, I think, just to feel that connection. It really, really does help. Well, I know this year that when you went to the president's mansion, that you met some people and that resulted in an opportunity for you to do some public speaking. So can you talk to me about that? Yeah, the transplant coordinator for the Jerusalem area is a very nice guy named Kirill. We invited him this year to speak at Liel's Fifth Memorial. And he actually gave some very important information that made my other daughter, Sapir, feel much better. She, she, as it turns out, was not 100% with the idea of donation until she met Carol, who explained what she missed five years earlier because she was much younger, the whole idea of brain death and when they take organs and there's no way back and, and there's no other option. It made Sapir feel a lot better. And then that's when I figured out with Kirill, maybe we really ought to take this on the road and speak to people. And he said, well, you know, I speak to people all over the place. I speak to high school kids. I speak to families. And I always like to have a donor family with me because there's something that only you can explain. And so I went with him and we recently spoke to a group of about 120 12th graders. And with us was a person I didn't know in advance he was coming. He had received a liver. And so between us, a friendly argument broke out. Who's the hero? I would say, you're the hero. You went through this difficult procedure, not knowing if you were going to come out of it. He says, you're the hero. You're the ones who enabled that procedure to happen. So that was kind of a friendly thing. <laughs> Wow. And it was kind of actually very interesting. The real the real moment came when I spoke to the kids. And I, of course, I because it's me, I broke down a few times. And they were enraptured. They were listening really intensely. And I said, I want to talk about my daughter, Liel, and tell all about the things that she had. And I talked about epilepsy, and I talked about SUDEP. And then later on, it's over. And I'm talking again with this recipient, and we're just sort of shooting the breeze a little bit. And I see these two students are waiting to talk to us. So I turned to her and said, yeah, can I help you? Do you have a question? And she said, well, you kind of scared me. I said, well, well, how? She said, I'm epileptic. I'm 17, and my name is Liel. Oh, my. So first of all, I learned next time, learn your audience better. Maybe not go there. 
But it was one of those moments where the world had bent itself around to bring us together at that moment to be at that point. And we tried very hard to, first of all, tell her that medication today is not what it was even five years ago and that she was already 17 and she was probably going to be okay anyway in terms of that. And that Leo had so many other things that were conflicting and so many other things going on inside her body that it was a foregone conclusion that Leo had a lot more trouble than this very nice 17-year-old Leo who was standing in front of us. And it was kind of a moment because my Leo would be 20. This Leal was 17. So there was one of those moments where, hey, but it, it worked out just fine. And I hope that we'll get to speak with more kids. And I really want to speak to families. I really want to speak to people who are maybe facing that moment. So if someone were on the fence about organ donation, Michael, what would you tell them? Well, that's pretty simple. The first thing I tell people is that of all the commandments in Judaism, if you have an opportunity to save a life, you really have to. Okay, so and saving life is a good thing, and you should feel good about it. And you're in a position where, with Liel's case, we made for 15 years, we made decisions regarding life and death. This was not a decision of life and death. This was a decision only to give somebody life from death. Okay, death had happened, and we were there as the final stop. No way back. So if you can save a life, you really have to. That's the first thing. The second thing is we were looking for a way to memorialize her immediately and with meaning. And there's no better way to do that than to have the gift of life. That person becomes a living memorial, a living monument to my daughter. And the third thing is, as silly as it might sound, any part of her that could continue to live is just fine with me. Really, if it could still go on living, whatever it was, I wanted that. And in a very real sense, she's not completely gone. In a very real sense, she lives on in four other people who are alive and well and doing the best they can. Uh, transplants are sometimes difficult. Transplants are not a great fix. It's a, a transplanted organ is a diseased organ by definition. It's a trade-up. We all know that. It's a trade-up from one disease to another disease. And yet, if I can help facilitate somebody do that, or I'll say to a family, if you can help somebody do that with your loved one, then you're going to find meaning in the worst tragedy of your life. And that meaning is a good thing. And saving life is a good thing. You'll never be able to bring your loved one back, but you will find some sort of peace. I love it. That is so true. And all I could envision while you were saying all of this was that seven-year-old little girl growing up and maybe becoming a mother someday, thanks Absolutely. to the kidney that you so generously donated. I just want to point out, because we talked about Mazal and we talked about the little girl, but we didn't mention that there was a 54-year-old woman who got a liver and a 45-year-old woman who got a kidney and a pancreas. We also donated to the bank a cornea and skin and cartilage. So we really ran the gamut on that. And there will be people that we don't even know who will be benefiting from the skin, the cartilage, the cornea. We don't even know. And it's okay with us to help somebody. I mean, the skin is a burn victim. The cartilage, we don't know, maybe an accident victim. The cornea is maybe somebody who's going to restore their eyesight, at least in one eye. And there's no end to it. There's no end. It, it really, really is the gift that keeps on giving. And every time you think about it, every time I go to that place where it hurts me, I can also realize that we've done a lot of good for a lot of people. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming on the show today, Michael, and for sharing all of these wonderful stories with us. Well, it's always a pleasure to talk to you, and every opportunity is a good opportunity. And every opportunity to talk about transplant is just a great thing. Thank you so much. It absolutely is. I feel like this was the perfect way to start off this season, Michael. That does conclude this episode of Heart to Heart with Anna. Thanks for listening today. Find us on iTunes and subscribe. And remember, my friends, you are not alone. This program is a presentation of Hearts Unite the Globe and is part of the Hug Podcast Network. Hearts Unite the Globe is a nonprofit organization devoted to providing resources to the congenital heart defect community to uplift, empower, and enrich the lives of our community members. If you would like access to free resources pertaining to the CHD community, please visit our website at www.hug-podcastnetwork.com for information about CHD, the hospitals that treat children with CHD, summer camps for CHD survivors, and much, much more. Thank you again for joining us this week. We hope you have been inspired and empowered to become an advocate for the congenital heart defect community. Heart to Heart with Anna, with your host Anna Jaworski, can be heard every Tuesday at 12 noon Eastern Time.